We're going to continue our series today uh, looking at Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 1. Just a quick recap because it's been a little bit before uh, since we last talked about Romans. We uh, finished Romans uh, chapter 7, and in chapter 7, Paul talked about you know, the law and, and uh, uh, the, you know, again, uh, expanding that the law is good, but the law can't save us. Um, and uh, talking about, uh, you know, our struggle with sin and that we are to walk according to the spirit and, and not according to the flesh. That we're to present ourselves as slaves to righteousness, not slaves to sin. Uh, and so Paul has uh, continued uh, from chapter 1 all the way through the end of chapter 7. He's been talking about justification by faith and sanctification, that process by which you and I uh, are made holy, that, that positional sanctification, sanctification where God declares you and I holy, and then that progressive sanctification where it's by day to day we walk and we make decisions as we're obedient with Christ uh, to Christ. Uh, and we draw closer to him and be, uh, continue to be molded more and more into the image of Christ and uh, living lives of holiness that are pleasing uh, to God and as we follow after the Spirit. And so here in chapter 8, uh, Paul starts with therefore. Uh, what he's getting ready to do here is he's actually about to introduce the results of what he's talked about in chapters 1 through 7. That whole, what does justification by faith on the basis of God's grace mean to us? And he has touched on this throughout the first seven chapters, but here in chapter 8, he is going to uh, dive in into uh, the results of being justified by God, being declared righteous, as God declares us not guilty, as God pardons us uh, for our sin. And no longer requires us to face the punishment for sin, which is death. What does that mean to the believers? So he starts off here and he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, not just the legal status of us being guilty, but also we no longer have to suffer the punishment that goes along with the sentence, right? We don't have to be, the sentence is not carried out with that verdict of guilty. Uh, that condemnation, we no longer have to feel guilt and shame uh, uh, for who we are or what we've done uh, because God has pardoned us, right? Uh, you know, uh, he, in our society, the President of the United States has the ability uh, to pardon uh, uh, individuals, uh, no matter how heinous the crime, he has the he has the uh, uh, constitutional right to pardon people. And every single time uh, when a president's term is about to end, uh, they go through a slew of pardoning people. Right? They pardon friends, they pardon relatives. We've had presidents pardon their brothers. We've had presidents pardon their friends. We've also had them pardon people that were potentially either uh, given sentences that were un not proportional to the crime that they've committed, uh, things of that nature. But when you're pardoned, it means that you are no longer uh, guilty in terms of the society now no longer uh, is to look at you uh, as, as being guilty of a crime. And you no longer have to suffer the punishment for that crime. And so in all intents and purposes, when you and I accept Christ as Lord and Savior, God is pardoning us. He's saying, I'm never gonna, not going to hold your sin against you anymore. And you're not going to have to suffer the consequences of that sin. And so therefore, we don't have any condemnation when we are in Christ Jesus. Every true Christian is in Christ Jesus. Every true Christian is united with Christ. So if you know Christ as Lord and Savior, you are in Christ Jesus, and therefore there is no more condemnation. So no matter what the enemy whispers in your ear, no matter what the enemy tells you about your past and what decisions you may have made before accepting Christ, no matter how he torments you uh, with those things, God no longer uh, condemns you and that is absolutely critical that we understand that God no longer condemns you and I 
The enemy loves to keep us beat down and depressed and upset and uh, frustrated and unable to move forward in our walk with Christ by convincing us that God is still angry with us. That God is still unhappy with us. That he's uh, sitting up upon his throne in heaven just waiting for us to mess up so he can zap us. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, waiting to, to, he doesn't, you know, he's just waiting for us to mess up so that he can punish us. And that is not it. If you and I know Christ as Lord and Savior, then God no longer uh, condemns us. And if God doesn't condemn us, then who can condemn us? Right? The one who created us, the one who breathed life into us, the one who planned out our lives. If he doesn't condemn us, then it doesn't matter what anybody else says, whether on this earth, of this earth, prince, uh, principality, whatever it is, uh, their opinion doesn't matter. It's what God's word is on the subject that matters. And so therefore, we are no longer condemned when we are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and of death. Right? So um, the Greek word here translated law uh, means a controlling power. So the controlling power of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Death. So we are no longer controlled by sin, but we are controlled by the Spirit of God, and we do not have to be controlled by sin, right? We are now controlled by the Spirit of, of, of Christ Jesus, of life in Christ Jesus. He's made us free. We are slaves to righteousness. We are no longer slaves to sin. And it should be the controlling power of the Spirit within us that helps us to live lives of holiness. He says, for what the law could not do. Here he's talking specifically about the law of Moses. Uh, but, you know, we know that that law of God is uh, upon our hearts, and that God's righteous standard. So what the law could not do, right? The law cannot deliver sinners from the penalty that it imposes. The law cannot make somebody righteous. So what the law cannot do, the law cannot save us. It only condemns us. The law points out where we are short, as we have discussed many times in the first seven chapters. So the law could not save us, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son and the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And so what the law couldn't do, God decided to send Christ to do, which was uh, come and live a sinless life. It says here that his own son was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh. So Christ uh, was, had no sin in him. Not at all. He was sinless, but he took on the form of flesh so that he could come to this earth, live his life sinless and perfect, and then ultimately sacrifice himself for us. The incarnation of Christ is one of those things that is difficult for you and I to understand that he can be both 100% God and 100% man at the same time. It's hard for us to understand, but it is clearly taught in Scripture that he was indeed both God and man. And he put on flesh so that he can come to this earth and so that he can live that sinless life, die for our sins, on the account of sin is why he came. Christ came Put on flesh because of sin to be a sin offering. In fact, the phrase there, on account of sin, uh, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, always used these words to render the Hebrew for sin offering and what's for guilt offering. What that means is, is that the way that that is understood is that Christ was a sin offering given his life as the perfect Lamb of God without blemish, without spot, for you and I, 
because we were bound by sin and there is no help for us except for his sacrifice. He condemned sin in the flesh. It doesn't just mean sentenced to death. It means put to death. God's condemnation against sin was fully poured out on the sinless flesh of Christ. He paid the price that you and I, so you and I did not have to pay it. God's wrath was poured upon Christ on the cross so that you and I are set free. Look at verse 4. So he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So uh, the thoughts, the words, the deeds, which the moral, moral law of God demands, that righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled, so we are no longer in bondage to that moral law's condemnation and penalty. The law does still reflect God's character and the, His will for all of creation. But the external, that written code, was unable to accomplish what, uh, what Jesus Christ was able to do. And the Spirit inside us, though, is able to give you and I the power to be obedient to God. So this Jesus came, he died upon the cross, he rose again, he sent, uh, God then sent the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you and I. And the Holy Spirit empowers you and I to be able to walk uh, in obedience to Christ. To serve Him. To not be controlled by sin. He says, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is a statement of fact. Meaning that if you Know Christ as Lord and Savior, your life will be characterized by a walk, by walk in the Spirit. Our lives will be characterized by walking in the Spirit, not characterized by walking in the flesh. So it is a statement of fact that if you and I know Christ as Lord and Savior, it's, we should not be walking in the flesh. We, if you're a Christian... If, if I'm a Christian, we should be walking in the Spirit. Now that word walk means, refers to a lifestyle and habit of living and thinking that characterizes a person's life. So we do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we're not supposed to walk in such a way that we're carrying out the desires of the flesh, that our life is characterized, our thought life, what comes out of our mouth, our actions, should be those that are controlled by the Spirit, not by the flesh. And we talked about, uh, uh, we, uh, the last time that we talked about Romans, that flesh on us, right, uh, that is, is, we're, uh, is a part of us until we have glorified bodies and we're no longer, uh, you know, on this, uh, you know, no longer have this flesh and we have glorified bodies. Uh, we still have this flesh that we have to contend with and fight with. And Paul made it clear in Romans chapter 7 that that is something that we will fight with and have to contend with. But we do not have to be controlled by it. Our lives not characterized by serving sin rather than serving God. Verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So all unbelievers, that's what it says, those who live according to the flesh. If you and I live according to the flesh, then something is wrong, right? It should be only unbelievers. So we have to sit back. If you and I, are lives are characterized by living according to the flesh, then we need to say, maybe something ain't right here. Maybe we uh, aren't who we think we are. Right? I mean, that's just the cold, hard truth. 
It should be unbelievers are the ones who do not walk according to the Spirit, who allow the flesh to control them and dominate them. So if we're allowing the flesh to control and dominate us, then we have the serious problem, and perhaps we need to really look at our relationship with God, and then we truly make Him Lord of our life. Because the flesh should no longer dominate us. That word set their minds is a Greek verb that refers to the basic orientation of one's mind, where one's mind is facing, what one's mind is focused on. And it includes one's affections, one's mental processes, and one's will. So for an unbeliever, Basically, that means that an unbeliever lives their lives striving to meet the cravings of a sinful, selfish flesh. Right? Uh, we, we've talked about zombies, right? Uh, it's, it's Halloween is tomorrow, but it's that craving, that carnal desire. You are uh, you're controlled, that unbeliever is controlled by this, this desire for one thing, to please, what, get what they want, when they want it, that selfishness and self-centeredness, despite everything else around them, that single-mindedness to please self. Mm -hmm. And that's not how you and I are supposed to live our lives as believers. In fact, if we are true believers, our lives will not be lived that way. Controlled by the flesh, single-minded, and our lives characterized by chasing after the things of the flesh. Continuing in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So all believers are those who live according to the Spirit, and again, they set their minds, everything that they are, the orientation of their minds, Right? On the spirit meaning to obey and serve God rather than the flesh. So no longer that desire to just meet our own selfish needs and our own selfish desires before, like we did before we were saved, before we knew Christ as Lord and Savior. But now we're pleasing God, not ourselves. We have a new master. He's no longer our flesh, but our master is Christ. That we're living our lives, uh, setting our minds on obeying Him, pleasing Him, serving Him. And that is our default disposition. Does it mean that we won't mess up? No. Does it mean that we won't sin every once in a while? No. Does it mean that we're not going to make mistakes? No. What it means, though, is that overall my mind is centered upon God, and even if I make mistakes, the overwhelming desire of my heart is to please the Father because He loved me. I love Him because He gave His life for me, because He had mercy on me. My overwhelming desire is to serve Christ. Yes, in my flesh I may make mistakes. I may sin, but my life is not characterized by sin. My life is characterized by desire to please God. And God knows the desires of our hearts. Amen. It's like that two sons I talked about. The one son, the father asked them uh, to do, uh, to go work in the, uh, the field and do something. And the one son said absolutely, but never went and did it, went and did his own thing. The other son got mad and said, no, I'm not. But then he went and did it anyway. Uh, the truth is God knows our heart. He knows uh, who we are. He knows the difference between what we say with our mouth and what we do in, with our lives. He knows the difference between what we project to those around us and what is actually on the inside of us. And so even though we may make mistakes now and then and not want to do what God wants us to do and we may make a bad choice, uh, the overwhelming desire of our heart is to fulfill the, what the Father has purposed for us to do, which is to go work in the field. Amen. Right? So even though we mess up and even though we're rebellious on occasion, right, uh, uh, the overall arching desire of our heart is to please our Father. Which means we go to the field even if we messed up. Yes. And that's where we're working. All right? All right, let's continue here. Verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. This is the, the Greek here translated minded, minded is the noun form of that verse 
in verb five, set the minds, or set their minds. Again, to be carnally minded would be to be focused on pleasing the desires of the flesh. So if you and I are carnally minded, then the only thing that can end, uh, result in is death. But remember, as a believer, you can't, you, you can't be carnally minded. All right? So we, we are no longer carnally minded. Right? Unbelievers are carnally minded. Unbelievers have that overwhelming desire to only please self and no one else. To, not, to disregard God. To disregard God, his statutes, his moral law, everything that he is, his sacrifice. To be carnally minded is the only one to please self and our own self-centeredness. And Christians cannot be carnally minded. Look, is that, are we, right? That is the truth. It is impossible. Do you remember when Jesus was casting out demons? And they said he's doing that by the power of Satan, Beelzebub. And Jesus said... What in the world are you talking about? A kingdom divided against itself can't stand. Why would Satan cast out Satan? Why would Satan cast out demons? That's completely opposite of what Satan does. It would go against his plans. You and I, being carnally minded versus being spiritually minded, they cannot ever go together. They're oil and water. You're one or the other. Carnally minded or spiritually minded. You're either carnally minded, fully given oneself over to selfishness or self-centeredness, or you're spiritually minded, you know Christ is Lord and Savior, your desire is to serve God, and you make mistakes occasionally. We, make, we do make mistakes. Please don't say that I'm saying you can be perfect. But our overwhelming desire is to serve and please God. And so, as Christians, when we've been justified by faith, we are no longer carnally minded. We are now spiritually minded. Right? Because the Holy Spirit, God changes us. We go from death to life. Right? Right? We're changed. Uh, it's, uh, we, we are completely and utterly changed before God. And that change is so dramatic inside of us that you can't be carnally minded and be a Christian. You cannot have your mind set upon selfishness and selfish desires and actually belong to Christ. I'm, I'm going to share something with you that some of you may disagree with, and that's okay. Well, one of the things that I've uh, grown up in my whole life believing is that uh, and, and, I, and I have been struggling with here in, in the last few years, is backsliding, right? I've struggled with that, the notion of backsliding. Because when you really study Scripture, God changes us. There is a change. Everything that we've talked about in that first seven uh, you know, uh, chapters of Romans, right, talks about the change that God makes in us, and we're going to continue to talk about in, in chapter 8. And God makes it very clear, or Paul makes it very clear here in Romans, that you cannot be carnal and be a Christian. It's impossible. You're either one or the other. And when God changes us, I struggle in my mind to reconcile how someone can go back to being spiritually dead when they've been made spiritually alive. I struggle with that. I do. That is something I struggle with when I look at this. Now, I'm not saying that, I don't, uh, that I've come to a conclusion but it is something I struggle with, right? Um, because God changes us so much and takes us from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. How in the world do we go back to being dead again? Someone who's truly been changed by the spirit inside of us, how do we die again, right? You think about that? Ever thought about that? I mean, when you really study scripture, so that is something I struggle with. Because you've probably known people in your life, I know I have close family members who made a profession of faith, but then for decades have lived according to the flesh and selfishness and self-centeredness. They, in all intents and purposes, have lived a carnally minded life. How is that possible? How are they spiritually alive 
And then they suddenly, somehow, what, they commit spiritual suicide? I, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? It's something I struggle with, right? Uh, that, that, you know, and, and, and for years, eternal security has had such a negative connotation to it. And like I said, I'm still working through it. So don't, you know, don't judge me too harshly because I'm still learning all these years. But it is something I struggle with because when you look at what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 8, he's saying this is the result of those first seven chapters of what God does for us. And one of those things is we are no longer carnally minded. We are spiritually minded. And if we're carnally minded, well, maybe we didn't accept Christ in the first place. We really didn't make him Lord of our life. But here's the thing. If you have an overwhelming desire to serve God above self, even no matter how many mistakes you make, that means you're okay with God. In terms of, it's when you and I get to the place, or are at the place, where we just don't care what God thinks anymore. Mm. Right? And there are people out there who live their lives that way every day. And, and, and that's hard. To reconcile how someone who made a profession of faith could go back to living like God doesn't exist. <clears throat> right? And you have to ask yourself, well, did they really believe in the first place? Right? And, and all of us make mistakes. And there are the, pro the pro prodigal son, right? Who ran away as fast as he could in the opposite direction of what his father had taught him. But ultimately, he came to himself and returned to his father, right? So uh, I hope that you understand what I'm saying today. It's just, you know, I could be real. I've been doing this for a lot of years. and tell you that that is something that I in internally struggle with. Because Romans chapter 8 is so very clear that a Christian, someone who's been justified by faith, is now controlled by the spirit, not by the flesh. And so that person's desire should be to serve God, to please him, not the flesh. Amen. That overwhelming desire, the orientation of one's mind should be to serve God and please him. All right, let's see here. Uh, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So if someone is carnally minded, they're an enemy at war with God. Now you remember, Paul says that you, when you and I accept Christ as Lord and Savior, we are no longer at war with God. We have peace with God. Right? But if you and I are carnally minded, we're at war with God. Again, if you and I know Christ as Lord and Savior, we are no longer at war with God. We should not be carnally minded. And you right? We have been, we are now at peace with God. And so we are, uh, the, but the, the carnally minded, those who do not know Christ as Lord and Savior, they are still at war with God. Why? Because the flesh will not subject itself to the law of God and continues to live in rebelliousness and not recognizing that they need a Savior. Okay? Verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So those who do not know Christ as Lord and Savior, it is impossible to please God. No matter how many good things they do, no matter how many uh, charities they support, no matter how many people they help, uh, if they are living, if they do not know Christ as Lord and Savior, they are not pleasing God. Right? No matter how many good things someone uh, that does not know Christ does, it is not pleasing to God. Because the fact is, it is many times motivated by selfishness. Right? Just look at the world around you. There are uh, businesses, millionaires, billionaires, they give a lot of money to charity. Do you know why? They need the tax write-off. So they pay less in taxes. Right? So they're giving a lot of money to charities, but it's for selfish reasons. Right? Uh, and so when we do, when the world does good things for selfish reasons, it does not please God. 
And, and when, when those who do not know Christ as Lord and Savior, they are typically the good things they do are done with selfish motivation, ulterior motives that may not be seen immediately, but will eventually reveal themselves. And so to, to, if we don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, it's impossible to please God. But you are not in the flesh, in the, uh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Look, you don't get any more obvious than that, right? If you and I have Christ, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, then we are in the spirit. If we know Christ as Lord and Savior, then we will walk in the Spirit. If we do not, then we do not belong to Christ. Ephesians says that God seals us with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the evidence that you and I are now saved. He indwells us. He empowers us. He guides us. He directs us. And if the Holy Spirit is there, you cannot be carnally minded. The Holy Spirit is there. We will walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. Our lives will be characterized by honoring God, a, a service to God, and honoring Him, not characterized by sin. All right? Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So if someone is not walking according to the Spirit, their life is characterized by selfishness and self-centeredness. Paul says here, they don't belong to Christ. Bottom line, he, they, uh, uh, he is not his. They do not belong to Christ. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of the uh, because of righteousness. Meaning, if Christ the whole is in us, we've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. We've been made dead to sin. We are now alive uh, spiritually. We've been reborn again. We're that new creation. The flesh is going to die, depart, but the spirit is the side of us and alive. That carnal part is to be put to death. But that new spirit man inside of us is to be alive and the Holy Spirit inside of us guiding us and directing us. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Simply put, the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead will raise our physical flesh as well. Because Christ lives, we will live also. So someday we will be resurrected and have a new body. And this sinful flesh will no longer be a part of us. But we will have a glorified, perfect body not corrupted by sin. What a time that will be. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. What does it mean to be a debtor? A debtor means I owe something. Who here has a credit card or a mortgage or a car payment? If you do, you're a debtor. It means that your house belongs to the bank until you pay it off. It means uh, those possessions you bought with a credit card belongs to the bank until you pay it off. You are a debtor. I am a debtor. I, I am in debt. I owe them something. They gave me something so that I could purchase a house. So I'm in debt to them. They gave me money so I could buy a car. So I'm in debt to them until I pay it off. Mm -hmm. Right? We are not to be in debt to sin or to the flesh. The flesh ain't never done nothing for us. But hurt us, destroy us. We don't owe the flesh nothing. Right? We will not be controlled by the flesh. The flesh has no power over us. Now listen, the mortgage company does. If you don't pay your mortgage, the mortgage company can come in and take your house. The flesh has, does not have that power over you and I. We are not debtors to the flesh. We are free because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we should not live our lives like we owe the flesh something. 
We should not uh, uh, live our lives like we owe the flesh something, like it controls us, has dominion or power over us because it doesn't. Why? Because Jesus Christ paid the price. He paid off your mortgage. Amen. He paid off, you, you see what I'm saying? He paid off the debt that we'd owe through his death so that we are no longer debtors to sin or to the flesh, but we are now free, belonging to him, and so we are debtors to Christ. So we're no longer debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. We don't have to live according to the flesh because the flesh, we don't owe it nothing. It has no control over us. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Meaning someone who doesn't know Christ as Lord and Savior will die because their life is characterized by a life living according to the flesh. So if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The Spirit inside of us, the Holy Spirit, giving us the strength every day to gradually grow more and more closer to Christ and becoming more and more like Him. It is a gradual process. It is not instantaneous. It takes time, a lifetime, to grow closer and closer and become more and more like Christ. No one will ever be perfect on the face of this earth. But we every day can make, uh, be changed little by little by little so that we become more and more and more like Christ. Amen. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Another emphatic statement. If you and I are led by the Spirit of God, then we belong to God. We are children of God. If we are not led by the Spirit of God, then we're not children of God. Right? We, we belong to God if we are led by the Spirit of God. So the results of sanctification, I mean of, of, of justification by faith and salvation, is that now uh, we belong to God. Verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again, but to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So uh, we, uh, as a result of uh, uh, accepting Christ as Lord and Savior, as, as being saved, as now being led by the Spirit and the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we now belong to God. We are adopted by Him. We are His children. Right? We have been adopted by God, and we are His children. Children. We are the children of God. So we don't have to be in bondage because he set us free. Amen. We don't belong to the world system any longer because he set us free. And not only does he set us free, he welcomes us to come in and set his table. Unlike sin, and unlike Satan, and our, the enemy of our souls, who wants us to serve him, and be slaves to him, right, and be controlled by him, God, even though he bought, bought us with a price, and he owns us, and we are to be slaves to him, he doesn't treat us like slaves. He brings us into the household of faith, to be his children. He adopts us to be his sons and his daughter. So we're not bound by fear any longer. We don't have to worry about dying and going to hell. We don't have to be, worry about being judged for our sins, being condemned for our sins any longer. We don't have to be in bondage to fear. I have a family member who is scared to death of dying. Because this person doesn't know what really is, is, is afraid of what it means to die. Was his mama right his whole life and he's going to be punished in hell? Or is he just going to go into nothingness and everything be over and everything he's done in this world doesn't mean anything? And so he is in bondage to fear. But you and I don't have to be in bondage to fear because we know that when our last breath here on earth means we take our next breath in heaven. So we don't have to be in bondage to fear. 
worried about being punishment or, or punished or worried about uh, going into nothingness. Uh, those who do not believe in God. We don't have to worry about those things. Because our treasure and everything, our home is really in heaven. We're just pilgrims here, passing through. And so we don't have to be worried. We don't have to be bound by fear. We've been adopted by God. And so much so that we can call him Abba Father. Now Abba there is Aramaic for the term Father. And it conveys a sense of intimacy. It literally means father or my father. It is what the Jewish children would call their daddies. Right? So, uh, you know, my boys called me dad, daddy. My, my, uh, uh, they now call me pops. Alex, when he was little, called me poppy. Right? Uh, it is a term of endearment. Right? It, 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 that is something they only can call me. Right? It's special because they're my babies. They're my children. Right? It's special. We have an intimate relationship. Right? Because I'm their father and they are my sons. Uh, the stranger on the street ought not be calling me pops or daddy or dad or father. Right? Uh, that's weird. Right? Because I don't have a relationship with them. They don't know me and I don't know them. Right? And then I love what Paul does here because then he uses the Greek word for father, which is pater, P-A-T-E-R, which is the Greek word for father. And again, that is that intimate term of daddy, papa, pops, whatever it is that you call your dad, that intimate, tender, uh, uh, you know, uh, title that we give to the one, uh, our fathers, because of love and the relationship that we have with them. And what's great about this is what Paul is showing here is the Jews call him Abba and the uh, uh, Greeks call him Peter, both mean father, meaning that uh, in the sight of God, uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek. He's the daddy to all, everyone who accepts Christ as Lord and Savior, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their race, regardless of their social economic status. Regardless, right, he is the father to everyone who believes. Amen. We are all children of God. We all belong to him. And the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Again, the Holy Spirit is given to us. And uh, Roman culture, uh, for an adoption to be legally binding, it required seven uh, uh, reputable uh, uh, witnesses. Um, they had to be there to attest to, the, uh, to attest to the validity of that adoption. Uh, with us, we don't need seven individuals. We just need the one Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Holy Spirit is the one who says this adoption is legit. He, this person, he or she, you now belong to God. You are his child. I've only had the privilege of attending one ceremony for when the children were adopted, uh, but it was awesome. You know, how excited the kids were and how excited the new mom and dad were uh, to, be, uh, to be their parents and for them to now have a mom and a dad, uh, you know, in their lives and stability. Uh, you know, you and I should be excited that we no longer are fatherless. But we have a God who loves us and cares for us and wants the best for us. And so much so that he gives us that, the Holy Spirit to seal us and then also strengthen us to walk according, uh, to grow closer to him, to, to become more like Christ. And not just that, but we are also made heirs with Christ. We have been made an heir of God, our Father, Right? Uh, in, the, in the Jewish culture, uh, the firstborn was the main heir and got all the stuff. Right? Remember with uh, Jacob and Esau? Uh, Esau was supposed to get everything as the firstborn, and Jacob uh, usurped him and, and uh, got in there and got the blessing instead, right? Um, and, uh, you know, within Jewish culture, the firstborn was the one who got all of the uh, uh, inheritance. 
Uh, but in Roman culture, they distributed it evenly amongst the family, amongst all the brothers and all the siblings. And when we're talking about inheritance here, we're talking about it in that uh, the inheritance is shared with everyone. We inherit eternal life. We inherit heaven, right? All of those things we inherit. Salvation, that glorified body, all of those things now. Uh, we inherit regardless of, of who we are in this world. In Christ, we are special. No matter how the world sees us in Christ, we're another, we're his child. We're God's child. And we uh, are to receive the same inheritance that anybody else receives. I tell you, when you look at this, there's absolutely no reason racism should ever exist within the church. Yes, that's right. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. All of us. God does not see skin color, does not see uh, any of those things, race or nationality. We're his children. We all belong together. We all love each other. And if we're racist here, we ain't going like heaven. Uh, uh, right? Uh, of course, I don't think you can be a racist to be a Christian, but you know what I'm saying, right? Heaven is going to be incredibly multicultural. People from all races, right? And, and so when you look at what the Bible says, I mean, we're all adopted. We're all children of God. There is no place for segregation or racism in the church. Even unintentional segregation, right? We are, all of our churches should be multicultural if possible. Right? We should worship together and love one another and serve one another. Right? That's how it's supposed to be because we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? Amen. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and have children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. If you belong to Christ, it truly are his, at some point you will suffer persecution. It may not be as severe as what our, uh, the, the early church fathers faced in terms of actually having to die or be physically harmed in some way, but eventually, if you are belong to Christ, you will run counter to the culture and you will suffer some form of persecution. Because you'll have to take a stand for Christ, which the world will not like. Right? And uh, if you take a stand for Christ against those who are standing against Christ, they will notice and there will be persecution. So, again, if you and I know Christ as Lord and Savior, sometime, at some place, we're going to rub somebody the wrong way. That's the way it is. Uh, and that's the way it's supposed to be. If you and I are on fire for God, we should make other folks feel uncomfortable. Thank you for listening to this message. We hope that you enjoyed it and were blessed by it. Each month, we have people from all over the world who listen to the messages made available. If you've been blessed by this ministry, would you consider making a donation of any amount to help support us as we continue to reach a loss for Christ? Donations can be made online at www.reviveoc.org or by check at Revive Outreach Church, 411 Chatham Heights Road, Suite 101, Fredericksburg, Virginia, 22405. Thank you for your prayers and your continued support. May God richly bless you.